So therefore, your commitment could be a little low. You, all, you feel a little frustrated in the sense that now I've learned this, I know I can do this job, but they're not letting me do it. They're not giving me the power or authority to do it in the organization. Therefore, there could be a situation where you are still what can be called a learning stage, but the commitment level is not very high. Now, how do you really inspire such a person if you are the leader? That's something to think about. It further develops into the experience stage where your competence level is very high. If you have spent three to four years in a particular aspect, you're master of everything of that subject of how to function. Extremely confident you know what you can do. The only difference again is whether you want to use it or not use it. Some people are extremely motivated, so they are, they are always volunteering for any challenge that comes up in that organization or company. They dive into it, they enthuse others to get involved, then that means their commitment level also is high. But you always find also people who know what they can do, they know they can do the job, but they rather let somebody else do it. You know, the commitment level is low. They rather say, okay, this is enough for me, why should I do anything more? Uh, even if I do this job, what am I going to get? I won't be promoted, somebody else will get promoted. So they'll get demotivated and they may not do it. So the, again, this combination of high competence and low commitment, again, has to be tackled because such people will be there in any, any, any team. And finally, you have this more rare person at the end, let us say, who's of extremely high performance and extremely high commitment. These are people who actually do not need a leader to get anything done because they are self-motivated. They also they have the skills to accomplish a job. Their frame of mind would be, why don't you just tell me what you want to get done? I will get it done. Don't don't hold my hands. Don't uh, don't don't uh, you know ask me to write fill in hundred forms for permissions. Okay, just let me know what result you want and I'll achieve it. And <clears throat> such persons can do it. But then the question is. Is it possible to let certain individuals go ahead and do that? What happens to the rest of the team? Because that might impact the others who may feel that you're being partial to one person, not realizing that you're delegating much more to that individual because of high competency and commitment, and because they'll get the job done. They don't need supervision. They don't need support either. But you'll have to take the whole team with you, so sometimes there is that issue of how to balance between these. But broadly speaking, between these various stages and leadership styles, you would see that there are some which are more appropriate and some which could probably be less, less appropriate and therefore less, less successful. It's fairly obvious that you know, for the beginner, where you're talking about low competency but high commitment, directing style would probably work. If somebody is learning things newly, whether it's a, whether it's a new, new game or whether it's the learning the ropes as a trainee in a department or a new company or anything in that place where the person is eager to learn but he needs to be told, he or she needs to be told what has to be done, how it is to be done, etc. So there, they're more comfortable if the senior person who, who is either, the, who is either the, uh, the reporting superior or could be somebody who is in charge of, of the department or telling them what to do. That's how they learn faster and gradually gain confidence. Where the competence level is improved but the commitment level is still could be you know, either low or not fully developed, then the coach becomes extremely important. Because some skills have been learned. I know how to, you know, let's say, <clears throat> play certain aspects of the game, but some parts of weakness are there. I don't know how to, or let's say my, my offense in cricket is far better than maybe the, my defensive play, and because that I'm getting out quite often. So how do I remove that? Just going and practicing by myself may not be enough. So a coach comes in, and the coach is able to say, okay, these specific things you have to address to remove your weakness in defense, so you become a much better cricket player, and therefore you probably get selected for the team and then give you more confidence to win. So a coaching approach becomes far, far, far better there. Even though in some cases it could be that you have to attend to the commitment level of the person also. Because of my weakness in not being a complete round cricketer, I may not be selected in the team. So every time I'm being the 12th man or left out of the team, then you have a problem. Because even though you feel I can play better and score more runs in this format of cricket than the other fellow is selected, but you will think it's because of partiality X, Y, Z. And you feel, the, you feel a low, low, low kind of commitment. You're demoralized. So the coaches then have to also deal with that aspect and say that, make the person understand it's due to a specific weakness in your technique that you're not being taken. The moment you improve that, probably a chance of selection are better and possibly also influence the team select selection committee in some way to give this person a chance that he had a weakness before, but now he's playing better, please take him into the team. Okay, so the coach therefore takes a lot more responsibility than merely telling him what to do and letting behind. Sort of get a little more involved, take responsibility for it. So that kind of a leadership style obviously works with such people. 
Now, it's interesting when you come to the experienced person. Now, here you have a person who feels that, you know, I'm highly competent, I've learned everything there is to learn. So what is that to learn for me? There's nothing more. Commitment could be either high or could be low. Again, depends on the mental makeup of the person. Because in some cases, people can say, look, for this job that I'm being asked to do, I've not been given a good rating last year, so why should I bother to do it? You know, whatever I do, I will not get a good rating in my performance appraisal. So let me just leave it there. But there are others who, who might say, I know that I will not get a good rating, they will still probably give me only a C, for whatever reason. But I like to do this thing done. For me, it's important that I accomplish this job well, therefore I will still do my best. So that depends on the same person, both the persons have the same level of experience or, or knowledge. But one is more highly committed, the other one is less, less committed, and the leader has to understand which one is working, so he applies appropriate style. Right? So whether it could be just uh, a coaching style, or in a case where there is low motivation, you also get involved in terms of supporting and trying to get the person out of their negativity and become more positive. You know, that is important to achieve something. It's not only for rating that you're working, it's also to achieve a certain end result, to feel proud that you're accomplishing something. So that kind of counseling means a lot more involvement and time. And the last one is easiest for a leader because you have a person who is extremely competent, very highly competent and very highly committed. All you have to do with them, as they say, is tell them clearly what you expect from them and give them the resources and then stay out of the way. You know, because sometimes you make the mistake and somebody is doing very well, you start hovering around that person, either because you feel insecure that he or she may do a better job and then, then the, all the credit will go to that person, so you might then be affected. Very often it happens in, in where, where there are 10 or 12 people and uh, if, the, if the boss who is there because of the title or because he's been there before the team members, if they get insecure, then that creates a lot of problems. So in order to be a true leadership style there, one must be willing to say that yes, this person is capable of accomplishing the result, high competence, high motivation, therefore all I have to do is let that person ask me what support he or she needs and give only that. Rest of it, let them, let them function independently and I just keep getting informed in terms of how things are doing well. Which also means when the result is accomplished, you're generous enough to give them full credit or whatever credit that they deserve and not try to grab that in quietly which sometimes insecure bosses do that the work is done by somebody but they take the credit and then try to pretend that you know because of them only everything happened now in any team situation department situation company situation you will find people uh, in the team who will have, be a mix of all these people now if you are the leader not necessarily only department head as i said at any level you will have your peers, your colleagues, etc., who would share probably these kind of attributes. If one can be analytical about it and, appro and uh, employ appropriate leadership styles, both to individual members of the team and to the team members, depending on where, as a team, they are. Because as a team, they may be competent, but commitment may be low. You have to still address it with the right style. So if these can be done, I think the chance of success become much more. And they also will see that the leader is doing something which they actually need. And will not see the leader as somebody who is, you know, is out of sync with their own uh, expectations. And that's really this. I must hasten here to add that this is not a model that I have developed. Some of you might have already seen this in literature. But I have seen this actually work in a variety of situations across, at various levels and across companies. And I think it's very useful for a tool that you can use. And it does not require very great analytical uh, skills or a whole lot of homework to get this done. If you can size up the the people in terms of the competency and the uh, commitment metrics in any situation where you're in a group and then pin the person down. Obviously, these are not also exhaustive uh, classifications, you know, because human beings are never tightly put in any, any, any grid. But who's predominantly somebody may be a learner, someone may be uh, an expert, somebody may be something else. Similarly, they may be so in the, on both the commitment and the competence axis. And if you can place the persons in the right slot, broadly speaking, and then employ appropriate leadership style with each of them, which requires for you to be aware that so-and-so is, when you're going to deal with them, you know that that person is probably in that, is, is, of, is of that type, therefore that type of leadership predominantly if you try and do. Which means with one person you may be a little more directing, making sure that person does the work the way it is supposed to be done, and that's appropriate for that person. Some other expert on the other side, you just give them your expectations, let them free, make sure no interference comes in their way, and let them complete the job and come back to you. If this kind of an approach is taken, uh, I, I have found at least that the chances of success uh, are much, much greater. 
and you, we have less kind of discontinuities in the team relationships and ultimately you, you succeed more often than you fail. Now let's look at the process itself. We looked at certain approaches broadly, but in terms of the process, the first thing a dealer in any situation has to do is to create a vision of what can be. Everybody knows what is, right? And what is can be either satisfactory, not so good, you know. But somebody has to envision that something can be better, only then people will feel, okay, let's move from here to there. If there is no vision of something better, then there is no scope or motivation for a, for, a, for a group of people to make any difference. Let's look at that Anna Hazare case itself, you know. Everybody is clear that there is a lot of corruption in the country at various places. We are all very demoralized about it. But in most cases, what we do is, let's stay, out, stay off there, let's be clean ourselves, let's manage our own family, our friendship, our relationships and, and manage our lives. But it takes somebody to say that, you know, this situation can be changed. Even if it looks so bad, this can be changed if people can come together, if they can protest, if they can pressure politicians into changing the way in which the, uh, they work, maybe we can make an improvement. And what did really Anna Hazare have except that belief and that moral strength of character to make sure that he will then lead that fight? He had done many other, many smaller fights like this in Maharashtra, as many of you are aware, and had got some success out of it. He had made even certain ministers resign, certain ML MLAs get out of their trust. So that success in small ways, purely because of moral character and by fasting, which was the Gandhian way of protesting, he was able to bring about change. But this time, nobody expected that this will have such a huge impact across the country. So the issue is to, to have a vision oneself and be able to generate an understanding of that vision with the people whom you work for. Now, this doesn't have to be something as big as this. To just give you an example, in one of my earlier assignments, I was given the task to actually create a greenfield company. This was to create a manufacturing company in India near Delhi, which had to be, let's say, a world-class agricultural tractor manufacturing facility. There are already companies in India which are making agricultural tractors. This is a foreign company wanting to come into India and wanting to create this. And <clears throat> I was the first employee, and I was taken, taken on as a CEO on the project head and was given this task. Obviously, being a multinational, they had various uh, ways of approaching the problem X, Y, Z. My task was to execute. But <clears throat> when I started recruiting the team, the first barrier I faced was having a designation, having a salary structure, part of an international company, all that is fine. But what are we expected to do? How will you bring out of nothing a project, which actually was, was, was an investment of, at that time, this is in the early 90s, an investment of over 500 crores, a manufacturing facility, uh, a complete assembly plant, that is, if, if you're aware of how an automotive assembly is, broadly of the same size. They create a supply chain, which is a whole host of suppliers, and on the other side, dealers, distributors, who will actually work with farmers and sell the tractors. Uh, and also have an R&D center, because this company internationally had only much larger uh, capacity tractors, which are not suitable for the small farms that were there in India. So we had to actually create new tractors appropriate for the Indian farmer. And that made it a much bigger challenge. It was not simply bringing in a product and creating suppliers, customers, and get, getting started. So the, the entire time that as people joined the company, and obviously I was, I was involved in the recruitment of every employee in the initial phase, whether they were research and development R&D employees, product development employees, uh, people to come in to actually build the factory itself uh, outside uh, Delhi and Greater Noida, uh, meet all the vendors and bring them up to the kind of specifications that you would need in order to really take it above the existing Indian standards and to what we, what we thought was world-class standards.